come together in this place to worship the name of the Lord. And I know it's the day after Christmas, but I don't know about you, but I still got a little bit of Christmas in my heart. But this is the day that the Lord has made, and as the Bible says, we will rejoice and be glad in it. So if you're ready to rejoice and be glad in it, give the Lord a big shout of praise. Come on, lift your voice, clap your hands, and we're going to celebrate.
We thank you, Lord, for your joy. We thank you, Lord, for celebrating your birth. Yes, but Lord, we thank you that, Lord, you didn't just go away, but that you promised to be with us today. Church, I know this year has been a bit tough. So this song I just wanted to sing together, if we would, this morning. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive is Ryan. This was the song they would sing while they were in Egypt. And mourns in lonely exile. Unto the Son of God, a Come on, let's sing. years the children of God were in darkness but that Savior came that night in a manger oh come thou day spring come and cheer our spirits by thine advent for the darkness to go. Death's dark shadows put to light. Come on, lift your voice, church, and sing.
and pressed into my heart. This is our final Sunday morning here together. And I know this has been a season that has been tough for the last two years, but for the last several months, especially here in River of Life. We've got several home watching dealing with COVID and situations. And when, if we're not careful, we're tempted to just kind of throw in the towel through the grief and through the discouragement. I'm gonna share with you something I've shared before several years ago, many years ago actually at Savage Road. One day I was walking the property and spending some time in prayer. And during that time, just having just a period of trial in my life and just things weren't going so well, just praying to the Lord and kind of feeling sorry for myself, I could be honest. And I was walking and that property was very old and had great trees and I'll never forget, the Holy Spirit caught my attention to one tree, one very large and old tree. And it began to speak to my heart and he began to have me look at that tree and I looked at that tree and there were limbs that were hanging. There were limbs that had fallen and were laying at the base of that tree and the Lord began to show me, said that tree is big and strong but that tree has been through many trials and many storms and many winds and some of the limbs have broken. Some of the limbs are bent and hanging sideways. Even some of the limbs are dead. But as you look closer and I looked closer, I began to see some of the leaves had green on them. Some of the leaves had life on them. And can I tell you, church, let me remind you of what Apostle Paul said, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. For we are hard pressed on every side, yet we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but we are not forsaken. We are struck down, but we're not destroyed. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man may be perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed every single day. For the light, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding an eternal glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, we do not look at the news, we do not look at the reports, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are not seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Can I tell you that though the sorrow may last for the night, though the tribulation may last for the night, though the loss may last for the night, hold on tight because joy comes in the morning. And so this morning, as this is our final service, I just felt the Lord wanted us to take some time and to think about the goodness of our God and to think about what He has done. And because He is still moving and He is still talking and He is still speaking, so can we end this morning and end this year on a note of thanksgiving? I know it sometimes through the pain and through the sorrow, but as the scripture says, rejoice always. So let's do that today. Of the goodness of 
winds have blown and rains have fallen, but we're still singing. I will sing of the goodness of God. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have left in my tank is a hallelujah. Nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing Hallelujah Hallelujah Come on, can we just fill this place with the praises of God? Let's sing it like this, let's sing Come on, my soul Oh, don't you get shy on me, lift up your song, cause you got a lion inside of your tongue, get up and praise the Lord. Sing it again. Come on, my soul, oh, don't you get shy on me, lift up your song, cause you got a lion. Hey! 
Can we give him a hallelujah in this place? Come on, give him a hallelujah in this place. Those of you at home, give him a hallelujah in this place. Because you are not forgotten. We are not forsaken. We've had damage, but we're still standing in the name of the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the promises of your word that says that we put our hope in you and this hope does not disappoint. Father, we know that when things don't make sense or we don't like them, Lord, we know that you're still in control and that you are still at the helm of this ship. And we give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. If you agree with that, give him one more praise. But today, I have a, a message on my heart that God has given me, and I want to share it with you. It's a perfect way to end the year, also to end our series on joy. We're going to go back into the book of Acts. Right where we left off, chapter 20. So won't you stand to your feet, open your number one best-selling book in human history, boot it up on your phone or however you got it. If you're at home online, go to Acts chapter 20. And we are finishing up a series on joy. And we are going to go right back into the book of Acts where we've been talking for a long time now. Uh, and thank you for the encouragement. Many are saying, hey, you're going to finish Acts. And so you've been enjoying it. So that encourages me. Uh, and so, yeah, I got some things I want to share for the new year, uh, but I will finish the book of Acts. <laughs> it's a, I love the book of Acts. So what we've been doing is going through the book of Acts, so many different ways to study it. And what we've been doing is going almost chapter by chapter, but really uh, being led by the Holy Spirit. And what I've been doing is whatever big event pops out to me on that chapter, I say, God, how can I relate it to the time we're living in right now? And he has done that. We learned that this is called a Kairos moment. How many remember that message? Go look it up on our YouTube channel if you haven't uh, heard that message about a Kairos moment. That means we got good timing. We, you ever be at the right place at the right time? Doesn't it feel good? You ever give the right gift? How many gave the right gift this year? You're like, yeah, I did good. How many did good? How many are like, man, I did awful. I stink. <laughs> Okay, you need a Kairos moment in your giving, in Jesus' name, amen? But when you're at the right place at the right time, and God just gives you favor, that's a Kairos moment. And he's been giving us a Kairos moment as a church family all year, uh, in spite of our battles. I mean, all that that's part of living this life, is you're going to fight your battles. But God has been with us. He's been blessing us as we go. So that's what we've been doing with the book of Acts, and we're going to continue to do that. And just lo and behold, we got a great scripture to enjoy and end this year in verse uh, 22 of chapter 20 of the great apostle Paul. He's leaving Ephesus, and he's getting ready to go on his journey to Rome. And things really change in his life right here. And he's speaking to a large audience, the elders of churches, and he, he gives us a, something of how he looked at life. And and I want to pick it up in verse 22. He says, And see now that I go bound in the Spirit in, to Jerusalem. I'm bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there. How many know that's a good way to look at next year? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I would love to tell you what's going to happen. Wouldn't you love it if God said, man, you know what, February, this is what's going to happen. March, this is what's going to happen. But sometimes we don't know that. God told Paul, he said, listen, I don't know uh, exactly, I can't tell you everything that's going to happen. Uh, just be committed to the Holy Spirit. And, but he did tell us the next verse. I go bound with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't uh, let me know anything but verse 23, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city saying that chains and tribulations await me. That's not very exciting, but that's in the Bible. And the very next verse is a foundational faith verse. Highlight it, circle it. This is the message right here. This is a powerful life verse of how the great apostle made it through the persecution of Rome and through everything else. He said, but none of these things move me. Come on, church. But none of these things move me. I don't know what 2022 has got entailed for me. I don't know if the Holy Spirit said, brace yourself. There's going to be some tribulations. But none of these things is going to move me. They're not going to move me. They're not going to move me. I got that anchor kind of faith. How many got that anchor kind of faith? None of these things move me. None of these things are going to move me. Nor do I count my life dear to myself. Whoa, that's like, what? What did you just say? He said, none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy. And the ministry which the Lord 
gave to me. I want to talk about today the joy of finishing. Thank you, Lord, for your word. I pray that, God, it would be deposited within our spirit today. Nothing else, if nothing else I say, Lord, we remember. Let us remember the words of the great Apostle Paul that the Holy Spirit penned through him for us today on the beginning of a new year, not knowing what 2022 has got in store for us, but let us have this mind that the Apostle Paul had and say that none of these things are gonna move me because I value your call over my own personal com comfort and I pray your will be done in the next few minutes while we listen to this word in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Go ahead and grab a seat. Well, I feel like I've preached already. I think we've already had church. We're in the great presence of the Lord in the place today, amen. Thank you, worship team, again. We're gonna uh, pick that up. Uh, in just a few minutes because I do want to end with going out this year on worshiping God. So if you didn't get in the first time just now, you missed it. You kind of felt a little chill bumps, but you backed down because you're a little tired, whatever, from the weekend. You got another chance coming. Amen? Amen. Tell the person next to you, you got another chance. Those of you at home, you got another chance. If you're just now tuning in, you know, you skip worship just to hear the word. I know some of y'all do that. You can just get another chance. We're going to worship again. How about that? Amen. Because you got to learn, listen, the enemy will fight us for everything, but never lose your praise. Never lose your praise. Let me just say that. Never lose the ability to give God praise. You learn that from King David. Never let him steal your praise. And you got to learn to put on that garment sometimes. Uh, but finishing, finishing, finishing the year. The joy of finishing, or finishing with joy, is what the Apostle Paul has said here. Thinking about this message and thinking about finishing, I, I love to watch um, animal channels. I get into that and that geo discovery. I've always been into that kind of stuff. I love nature. I just love that. And um, something I just learned new that I did not know about cheetahs. Now, you know, the, the cheetahs can run fast, right? Run 70 miles an hour, actually 72 miles an hour. I mean, that's fast. They got their go fast shoes on. They can, they can go. Uh, I've always loved cheetahs, you know, they're at the zoo, you know, they're always sleeping, but when you do get there in a good time, when it's not so hot, you can get to see them. They're fascinating animals, but what I did not know was their uh, life expectancy is also only 10 to 12 years old, and that it all has to do with their heart. You see, they can't keep that 72 miles an hour pace very long. And I know that. So what will happen was a, a cheetah will go after its prey, and it will just, I mean, it'll just take off. It'll just burst with speed. It's the fastest land animal on planet Earth. That thing can run. And uh, 72, but it can't maintain that speed. So what it ends up doing, if it doesn't catch its prey, it ends up slowing down and just settling for whatever else comes its way. And because the heart of a cheetah is not designed for longevity. It's not designed for it to run and maintain that kind of speed. But then if you look at the tortoise, the tortoise, listen to this, the tortoise, you ready for its max speed? The maximum speed of a tortoise is 0 0.62 miles an hour. <laughs> a baby can crawl faster than a tortoise. So you got a cheetah that can run 72 miles an hour, but it cannot maintain that speed, and it can only live 10 to 12 years old. But you take a tortoise that can only run 0 0.62 miles an hour, its life expectancy is 188 years. Why? Because the tortoise isn't built for speed, it's built for longevity. Let me just tie that into what I'm saying to you today, that, that if you're like me, sometimes we run when we're excited about something, we're so excited about God or something that he's doing in our life, and we may burst and take off like that, but after a while, we begin to fade out, and we, be, and we wrestle with that. I wrestled with that when I first got saved. I was so excited about God, and I went running out the gate like that cheetah, and I got saved in November, and by January, I was questioning my salvation. I already began to feel that speed begin to leave me, and God began to show me, listen, it's not about being built for speed, but it's about being built for longevity. And, and let, the, let the Holy Spirit work, speak to your heart. I want you to know that God hasn't designed us as his children to be like cheetahs. 
He designed us to be like the tortoise. He designed us for longevity and to last long and, and to be able and be able to follow God and to finish our race. Finish our course. Fight the good fight. Keep the faith. That's what Paul said. And so we look at Paul's life and he showed us how to do that. And that's what kind of a man he was. And that's what kind of a, a, a person he was. And first, it must start with this. It's not on the screen, but never forget this. It starts with having a plan. It starts with, with having a plan of finishing your, your, your life with Christ. Can you say, you should be able to say that I am going to serve Jesus Christ until the day I die. Or until Jesus comes and gets me. Can you say that really, honestly? You have to have a plan. See, Paul the Apostle had a plan when he got saved. His plan wasn't to try this Jesus thing to make my girlfriend happy. To try this Jesus thing to make my husband happy. To try this Jesus thing because everybody in my family is going to that River of Life church. And so i got to go see and get a coffee and see what the big deal is. So i just got to go. No, no. You have got to get to the place where you say, I want to not just try Jesus like you try that broccoli casserole over Christmas dinner. But... I want to I wanna serve Jesus Christ and live for him for the rest of my life on planet earth. Amen? You believe that? Or until Jesus comes. You may say, man, that goes without saying. No, no, no. You got to see yourself. In fact, when I got saved, I was 25 years old. And I looked around in the church and it was a very large church. And there was some young people, uh, but most of them were older. And what I had to do is because I didn't have too many young people at my age serving the Lord, I was really the only one at that time to come in from my family, from my uh, friends and serve God. So I had to get a mental picture in my mind, and I literally did that. I got a mental picture in my mind of serving God the rest of my life. In church, worshiping with my wife, I had a mental vision and a mental picture of bringing my girls to church. And I showed up, we showed up on Wednesdays, got them into girls ministry, because it wasn't something I was going to try. It was something I was going to do. If I was going to live this Christian life, I was going to do it with all of my heart. That's, that's, what, that's what I'm trying to get us about, uh, about finishing. That's what the Apostle Paul did. He had a plan, and then he built his life around that plan. And his plan was not to be the most popular. It was not to be the greatest apostle with the biggest following on Twitter and to have the best Instagram and, and the best robe looking and the best sweetest camel or whatever it was. His, his goal was to not be the most popular, but to outlast them all. I'm preaching good on this last Sunday at 20. I'm talking about finishing. Finishing. Look at this scripture again in verse 24. But none of these things move me. That's a life verse. That's a life verse. You need to circle that verse. None of these things. I mean, the Holy Spirit tells me that in every town I come into, I'm going to face tribulations and chains. What if the Holy Spirit spoke to you and said, oh, you, you know, we're praying, God bless us this year. And he goes, oh, you're going to have one of the worst years you've ever had. What if he said that to you and me? We'd be like, say that again, Lord. <laughs> That's what the Holy Spirit said to Paul. Paul, I've called you. I've set you apart to be this great the apostle. But you're going to have chains and tribulations in every city you go to. You're going to have people turn on you. You're going to have people that you, you think that they're your, they're your friend and they're going to make fun of you and they're going to come against you. They're going to plot. They're going to lie. They're going to bring false witnesses in there and lie on you and accuse you. You're going to be all by yourself. You're going to go without eating. You're going to be poorly dressed, he even said later. And, and he's single and Peter has got a wife and all these other apostles has got a wife. But Paul is single and he's giving marriage advice about how to treat your wife. And he's going, when is my day going to come, God? When am I going to get the nice car? When am I going to get the nice job? When am I going to have all my kids worshiping God instead of hating and killing and fighting each other? When is my day going to come? No, no. He said, you know what, God? I know it don't look like it's fair. No, I don't have the best of everything else. But none of these things move me from the fact that I'm going to finish my race with joy. Come on, somebody. I'm going to finish this thing. I'm going to finish this thing. Come on, tell somebody I'm going to finish this thing. I'm going to finish this thing. He didn't start right. In fact, most of his adult life was worshiping the wrong God and being all in religion and, and fighting against Jesus. He didn't like Jesus. He didn't believe in Jesus. 
And he was an adult man before he came to know Christ. But it's not on how you start, but it's all about how you finish. Somebody say, come on now. We all have that. But I love that verse, but none of these things move. So I may finish my race with joy. Just two things I want to pull out of this text today. Won't keep us here too long. I'm going to quit lying in church. But you talk about finishing, I got to say this, you can't talk about finishing without talking about commitment. We all know it. I want you to write down fully committed. Make it easy today. I'm going to explain what I mean by that because we have different versions of commitment. <laughs> Don't we? I ah, know I do. You going to help me out? You know, you going to do this, you going to do that? Yeah. Fully committed. You can't talk about finishing without talking about committed. And we find this from the verse that he says. And we skipped over it. I did emphasize it a little bit. But if you're, if you're reading this story, you may skip right over this part because it's Bible language. And we kind of like, mm, what does he mean by that? But that little statement where he says, uh, but I go to Jerusalem bound with the Spirit. Did you catch that? He started off in ver uh, describing where he's going. But I go bound with the Spirit. That word bound, let me give it to you because it's, Nothing in our English language that we talk about, bound, but it's a Greek word that is deo, and it means to be bound to one, as in a wife or a husband. It's not about marriage. You see, I use marriage a lot when I preach because the Bible does. Our relationship with God is, when you become a Christian, you enter into a covenant with God. We are called the bride of Christ. I mean, oh, Jesus is coming back for his bride. Without spot or wrinkle. Remember that? Without spot or wrinkle. You know, that, oh, that's, that's true. He's, we are the bride of Christ. And we have all of these examples and metaphors in Scripture about our relationship with God and being married. And so here he goes about his illustration with the Holy Spirit. He's married. He's, he's, he's not just, you know, serving Jesus sometimes. No, no, no. He's, he's committed. He's committed. It's, He's committed, like this wedding ring I wear. Now, I have a wedding ring that's not gold. It's actually made out of titanium. It's not the prettiest to look at, and I had a gold one, and gold's awesome. If you have a gold ring, awesome. And silver, many people got different things, but we have, I have a titanium one because although it's not the prettiest, it's one of the strongest metals on planet Earth. And to me, which we'll be celebrating 30 years this year of marriage, Give God some praise for that. People say, what did you get married when you were 12? No, first of all, first of all, they don't say that to me as much anymore. I don't know. If they... <laughs> but we did get married early, and uh, our marriage has been through some things, especially in the early days. And so, uh, but when we got God in there, he changed everything. But marriage is not always about looking pretty. It's about being tough. It's about lasting. It's about being committed. Come on now. This is, this, is, this is what Paul is saying. And this is what marriage is about. This is about our, but it's also about our relationship with Jesus Christ. He says, I'm, I'm married to the Holy Spirit through death, through sickness, and in health. Through trials and tribulations, I'm bound with the Spirit. I'm Deo. I'm married. I'm fully committed to the Holy Spirit. So that even though the Holy Spirit done warned me, if I go to Jerusalem, I'm going to have some serious uh, pushback. I'm going to have some chains waiting me. That's not fun. Getting beat with whips and getting beat with rods. He was beaten with rods three times. Rods bruise your bone. You ever have a, a bruised bone? It hurts, man. You may not even know it's there and think you're getting better, and then all of a sudden you hit something and just bump it, man, and it just shoots pain like through your whole body. That's a bruised bone. That's how they would, they would beat uh, people that followed the Lord. This was part of the Roman punishment, was beating with rods, metal rods. He had that happen to him three times. And he's talking about, he didn't like it, he's not enjoying it, but he's so committed to the Lord that he's saying that none of these things move me that I'm still going to follow God all the way through. Why? This is the whole point. He valued the call over his comfort. This is, this is how you finish. This is how you finish. We have to value the call, and we're all called. If you are a follower of Christ, the Bible calls you, you are called. You are called. He called you. You may be the only one in your family uh, serving Jesus. You know why that is? 
You're the only one that responded to the call. The Bible calls it, you're called. Many are called, but few are chosen. In fact, God, the call goes out all the time. The call is going out right now. Jesus loves you. He's got a plan and a purpose for your life. He's got a better life for you if you would just choose to follow him. What did I just do? You sounded pretty preachy. I didn't preach. I just called you. I just called you on live. Whoever's watching on, I, I called you. That God is calling you to a life to follow him. Those that respond to the call, guess what? Become the chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. The call goes out. But he, he valued his call over his comfort. In the next chapter, he even goes and he hangs out with Philip the evangelist, who had four daughters who were not married, but they were prophetesses. They were prophets. The house was a very prophetic home. And Paul stops in to see him, to get a word from the Lord, and just probably to talk and, and, and to discuss his journey to Jerusalem. And the Bible says a prophet by the name of Agabus comes into the room. And he comes from Judea. He's a well-known prophet. And he come into the house there. And the Bible says there was a lot of people there because uh, Paul had a whole team. So they're all at Philip's house. Philip the evangelist, he's got his four daughters there. And where there's four daughters who are unmarried, I'm sure you got some fellows hanging out. <laughs> So you got a whole room full of people. This prophet comes knocking on the door, and they let him in, and he looks over, and they have cloaks and outer garments in those days, just like you have coats today and things like that. And this prophet just began to go right into the things of the Spirit. He grabs a belt, and he pulls it out of the clothes, and he sits down, and he ties this belt around his feet, and he ties it around his hands. How would you like your guests to come over for Christmas and do that when they walk in the door? It's an odd way for someone to come in. But these people are all focused in on God. They're praying. Paul's getting ready to go to a journey that he don't even know what's going to happen, but he knows it's, it's pretty tough. And this prophet begins to say this. They all look at the guy, of course. He looks at him and he says, Thus says the Holy Spirit, Whoever owns this belt, so will the Jews do to you if you go to Jerusalem. I don't know about you, but I think I'd be going cancel on the trip to Jerusalem. That's exactly what the prophet did. And the Bible says they all at one begin to say, See, Paul, I told you. Don't go to Jerusalem, man. Them Jews, they're not down for this Jesus stuff. Look what they already stoned you. I mean, you done did this, you done did that, and you're going to go to Jerusalem. The prophet is saying. By the way, it's a good note to see here about prophecy. The prophet didn't tell Paul anything he didn't already know. He, he didn't tell him anything new. But he just confirmed what the Holy Spirit had already been telling Paul. That's worth your money. You come to church and your gas money right there. Prophecy always confirms, we're going to be teaching on the gifts of the Spirit on Wednesday nights coming up, and I can't wait. We need to learn to be uh, people of the Spirit anyway, and to be in tune with the Holy Spirit. You know the Holy Spirit has an answer for every question you have right now? Regarding your job, regarding even the future is right here. It may not always be the answer we want to hear, but he has an answer. We just got to slow down and learn to get in step with the Holy Spirit. Oh, I, that's coming to a pulpit near you real soon. But they all rallied around Paul and said, Paul, did you just hear the prophet? By the way, the prophet, again, he didn't say you couldn't go. He just said, if you do go, this is going to be... You know what Paul said? Read it in the next chapter. He said, why do you keep saying this? You're breaking my heart. He said, I told you already that I'm not afraid of the Jews. Even if I give my life, I'm going to give it for the call of Jesus Christ. Come on, man. I mean, how many can respond to that? That's what I'm talking about, finishing. Now, I'll be honest, you know, none of us are going to be arrested. For, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> maybe for our faith. Who knows? It may be illegal. I think it eventually will come. My personal opinion, I believe it will eventually become illegal even in America to preach some of the messages in the Bible. I really do. I believe we're, we're here. Many of our churches in Europe today, the pastors have to submit their notes to their message on Sunday and get it approved before they share it in the pulpit. It's happening right now, Assembly of God churches in Europe. And we have freedom right now to worship, and it's awesome. But it could happen to us that we don't have that. You know what I'm going to do? Say this, none of these things move me. Right. Amen. We're going to have to start a prison ministry a little earlier. <laughs> Hallelujah. But what about you? What about you when your friends turn on you and they make fun of you because you want to do a Bible study instead of go get turned up on Friday night? What are you going to do when, when it's more important for you to keep your money, want to support a missionary that God speaks to you or, or want you to do something like this, rather than what everybody else is buying is the new this and the new that? 
You've got to be at the place where Paul says, none of these things move me, nor do I count my life. What he's saying is not that he don't love himself. He's just saying myself is not my God. I value the call over my comfort. Because you can't have growth and comfort at the same time. Jesus said, pick up your cross and follow me. He didn't say, pick up your lazy boy. Pick up your lazy boy and follow me. And, you know, when it gets really tough, you can, I understand, you can go and find another guy. No, no, he said, he said listen, you got to follow me. Take up your cross. We wear them, you know, on our necks, a pretty little cross. Hallelujah. It's great. I have one. It's beautiful. But we're called to carry them on our backs. And it's the emblem of Christianity. It's a life like, you know, it, it's what we're called to do. I'm going to get to the good part in a minute. Some of you are like, whoa. But i got to tell you this. This is what Paul said. I'm going to tell you that in a minute. But we're called to do, the, the call of God and the will of God will interrupt our will all the time. Again, it's like being married. You're going to want to do something, but your spouse wants to do something else. Have you ever been there, married people? Have you ever liked something you wanted it really, really bad and you couldn't wait to show your husband or your wife and then you show it to them and they're like, what? I don't even like it. You just go, shh. Welcome to the married life. Amen. So you got a decision to make. Either you start a fight, which she's going to win. I'm just going to tell you that right now. Because they remember everything. I'm just saying, they just do. Or you're just going to have to learn to adjust, right? And marriage is what? I'm turning this into a marriage message, I guess, Nick. I don't know. Somebody might need it. It's been a rough year on marriages, I think. Um, you got to learn to adjust because marriage is a lifelong adjustment. It is, isn't it? Your relationship with Jesus, guess what, is the same way it's adjusting. But I don't think he's adjusting. We're going to have to adjust to him. And the will of God always will interrupt our will. We want to, want to do something, the Holy Spirit will come and he'll, he'll want us to apologize. You don't want to apologize. But we're called to apologize. We're called to forgive. We're called to encourage. You don't feel like encouraging nobody. You're discouraged. But if you're called over your comfort... You're going to say, God, I know it's not comfortable for me to do this, but I'm going to, I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to forgive them. I'm going to wash feet. That's serving. That's, that's serving. Living godly. Come on. Living godly. I'm just reminding us of the call. And we've got to learn that it's not always going to be comfortable. Now, here's the good part. Is when we live our life like this, there, there is a joy this is a, so good. It's something that I heard before I got saved, but didn't believe it until I experienced it. So you ain't going to receive this and believe it until you've experienced it. But those of you that have experienced it, says yes and amen. You, you enjoy and have a special joy and delight when you suffer for God. There is a level of intimacy and, and a level of knowing Jesus that can only be learned in a season of trials and tribulations. I think four of you got it. I got a scripture. Guess who it's by? This great apostle. He says in Philippians, this is my life goal, that I may know him. How many want to know God? I want to know God. You know what's so cool? One of my favorite verses in the Bible is the Beatitudes. It says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I'm going to see God. Well, Don, we're going to see God. You ever think of that, man? That'll really bless your day. We're going to see it. We're going to understand everything. We're going to be like, wow. But he says, I want to know him. Watch this. And the power of his resurrection. Come on, somebody. Somebody got me a shirt for Christmas that said, come on, somebody. <laughs> I'm going to wear it with my new Adidas. Come on, somebody. Look out. We should be the joyful people on planet Earth. Amen? Enjoy life, but forgot what I was saying. It must have been good. Come on, somebody. Huh? Power of his resurrection. Thank you, Mary. I love the front row. You guys are awesome. We love the resurrection. We love them kind of scriptures. We love them kind of exhortations, right? Paul said, I, I want to know him in the power of resurrection. And when the healings happen, when the miracles happen, when God makes a way when there is no way. How many said to heaven, man, that's God. That check came in the mail. Man, that, he answered my prayer. I got that raise. I got that bonus. My son told me they love me. My son, they're coming to church. I mean, when you're having one of those kind of seasons. That's the resurrection power. That's the resurrection power, ain't it? 
Isn't it awesome when you're in a season like that? Thank you, Jesus. Paul said, I want to know God. Everybody can know God like that. But then he goes on. There's not a, there's not a period there. You see it. It's already been on the back. Some of you don't read it three times. And the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death. Now, notice he didn't say fellowship of resurrection. He said power of resurrection. But there really ain't no fellowship there. Why? Because even unsaved, lost people experience the power of God. Do you know everybody Jesus healed was a non-believer? I think it's 90%, someone told me, of the people that Jesus healed were pagans and unbelievers. They were not followers. He healed Gentiles who were pagans. He made an extra trip to talk to a woman who's been married five times and shacking up with number six. She would not even be allowed in many churches in that day. Jesus made an extra trip just to go to her, sit down and tell her that he's loved by the king of glory. That's Jesus. Many of us experienced, I've experienced the power of God before I got saved. He, he had his hand on me and saved me from the craziest car accidents and the sh nights of violence, living on the streets and living in southwest Detroit. There's stories that would, you would not believe that me and the guy on the second row of the church could tell you. But look at God, Ladon. Look at where we are, baby. Isn't it God? That, that's the power of resurrection. Isn't it amazing? That's the power of resurrection. And many of you have had those stories too, right, Tomas? I mean, we go all day. I can pass that mic easily. And we can all talk about the power of his resurrection. I told our camera crew, don't worry today. I'm not going to get all excited. I'm going to stay on the stage. <laughs> we're trying our new cameras and stuff out. We got a lot of new stuff coming. And we're going to be in here for a minute, I think. And, um, which is a good thing. God's grown us as a church, and we're experiencing good things. Again, that's the power of resurrection. Those are good things. But here's the point. If you really want to learn to finish in your Christianity, you've got to learn that second part of that verse. The fellowship of suffering. It's when you're eating your food all by yourself because everybody left you and abandoned you. The ones that said they're going to be there with you, no matter what. They left you. And like I said at Christmas Eve, Emmanuel, God with us. Even if you got some loved ones that are not with you or some friends that are not with you right now, you got God with you. Amen. That's Emmanuel. Amen. Come on, come on. Watch this. Paul said, I want to know him in the power when he answers prayers. When he, that guy fell asleep while Paul was preaching and he went over and laid hands on him and laid on him and loved on him and the man's breath came into his body. That's the power of resurrection. But then in 2 Timothy, you write that he had a friend named Trophimus who was an intercessor. And the Bible says he was sick. And Paul prayed for him and he didn't get healed. So Paul had to leave him sick and mildness and continue with his journey. Why didn't God heal that guy? I preached a whole message about what happens when you get a James instead of a Peter. Right? That's this verse right here. That's the fellowship. That's when you get to know Jesus. When, you're, when you go through those seasons, if you lean into Jesus in those seasons and not get all bitter and mad, because that's what, that's what the enemy wants you to do. The enemy told Paul, look at you, Paul. If you were a real apostle, you, know, you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't have all these people hating on you and beating you with rods. And You're a very educated man, Paul. You come from Tarsus. You sat at the feet of Gamilia. You come from Turkey, the second largest library in the ancient world. He was a very sophisticated and educated man. And now you're roaming around with these peasants, going village to village with these Gentiles, talking about this Jesus. You have no food. You have no clothes. If you really had God's favor, you would be having this. You would be... Has anybody else had them voices come into your head? If God was really with you, then you would be, you would be. No, 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 maybe I think he's saying, you've known about my power of the resurrection. But Paul, I need to know you in the fellowship. I want to get to know you, and you need to get to know me a little bit more. But it only going to come through the suffering. Through the season of suffering. I love that scripture that Jesus said, whatever uh, the Lord says to you at night. You know what that is? That's the dark season. David wrote in Psalms many psalms about the dark season. Who am I preaching to today on this last Sunday? God will speak to you in the dark season. The fellowship. I got to tell you this, if you want to finish. If I didn't care if you finished, I would say something about all about the resurrection and that's all we would talk about. But you can't live on Twinkies. 
spiritually speaking, a sugar rush gets you feeling good, man. You can ready to run, but you're like a cheetah. You run out of gas before you hit the back. Amen? The word of God spiritually is the same way. You can't eat and live off of those sugar scriptures. You got to know about this suffering, that I may be conformed to his death. Who says that? Do you know what kind of death Jesus lived and died? Paul, what is wrong with you? And a couple chapters later, he says this kind of stuff in front of King Agrippa. And King Agrippa said, Paul, all this learning has driven you mad. <laughs> and I love Paul. He's in chains. And he said, I'm not mad, King Agrippa, but I wish you'd become like me. And then he says, except for these chains. I love Paul, man. You wouldn't really want to finish fully committed. Let me just get this before we start to close. But he said the fellowship of seven, the fully committed. What I mean by that is because twice in this text, he talks about having a clear conscience. So if you take in notes, you can write down conscience, clear conscience. It's not on the screen, but this is fully committed because we have different versions of commitment. Paul said twice in the scripture, I live the kind of committed life to Jesus that I have nothing hidden. I, I don't hold back. He said, he said, my hands are clean of all men's blood, for I have not stopped to hold back and give you the full counsel of God. He said, I, I live a life that's, my conscience is clear. I live a life that's fully, sur I'm not perfect, but I'm fully surrendered. That's a good way of living, uh, of looking at the Christian life. God doesn't expect us to be fully perfected, but fully surrendered. Yes. Did you hear me? Yes. You don't have to be, you don't have to be like a marriage. You know, you're not perfect and because you're not married to a perfect person. Well, you, they're not married to a perfect person either. Well, what makes a marriage good is when they're both fully committed. Isn't that so true? Isn't that so true? Fully committed. He says, in other words, God, I don't have anything hidden. I don't have anything really hidden when it comes to my ministry, when it comes to serving others, when I tell people, you know, I, I tell them these kind of scriptures and rather than just Twinkies. I tell them that, man, you know, life's going to be hard sometimes. Fully committed. I say this sometimes when I have altar calls, um, but I haven't said it in a while. But this is a good to just put it in right here. Sometimes I'll say, if you were in an airplane, and the pilot said, we're experiencing problems, brace for a land, crash landing. You, you ever hear on a plane, the stewardess come out and they give you that little spiel, everyone dozes off and looks at your phone, but she goes through the whole thing with the seat belt and all that. Do uh, you ever notice that they, in case of a water landing, <laughs> have you ever heard them say those words? <laughs> a water landing. <laughs> okay, I think that's hilarious, okay? I'm like, <laughs> We're going to, what? That's a nice way of saying, in case we crash in the ocean. That's exactly what they mean. They ain't got no landing gear. No skis are going to come out on that big 747. People don't even, listen to what she says. It's hilarious. Everyone, you know, usually drinking or eating or something. Oh, you got your mask on. You got, whatever. Water landing. Okay. But she says that on the way down, if you're, if you're in a plane, if, you're, if the pilot said we're crashing, would you be the type of person that says, God, into your hands I commit my spirit. I want to be clean before you, Lord, and just I thank you and, and just hear into your hands. Or would you be the type of person that would say, you know what, God, forgive me for this. Forgive me for this. Forgive me for this. Well, I just did this Thursday. Forgive me. Think about this. Paul the Apostle is saying, if my plane goes down today, I can honestly say I haven't hidden anything from God. I'm not perfect, but I'm fully surrendered. What am I saying? This kind of thing has got to be in our DNA if we're going to finish with our God. Because we can't have hidden things in our life and expect to finish. Sooner or later, those hidden things will begin to get bigger and bigger and bigger and steal our attention and our affection from God to them. That's what Jesus said. That's what, he, that's what I talk about, fully committed. Twice he said that. He said, I'm not going to hide anything. My hands are clean. My heart is clean before, oh God. 
Constantly, I pray that. David prays that all the time. That's how we are to live. Like, you know, I'm not perfect, but God, uh, I want to get rid of this. Let's go into the new year. If we're holding on to some things, this is a great opportunity to say, you know what, God, I'm not bringing these things into the next year. I'm leaving these behind, and I'm going to come. I'm going to come deeper. I love for all of us at River of Life, all of us. I don't care how long you've been serving God. All of us to be willing to go deeper in the things of God next year. Go, go closer to, the, to God. Go closer in our heart. A, a more fully surrendered heart to God. That should be our goal and our plan. If we're going to be like a tortoise and not the cheetah. And last thing, and then so I'm going to finish. The second thing about this is he does say, he, now that has to do with finishing, commitment, fully committed. Has to do with finishing. It's not real deep, but might have gave you some new perspective on what that word really means. But then he says, finish with joy. Isn't that interesting that he said Joy. He didn't say, um, I want to finish and be the most popular. He didn't say, I want to finish and have the most money. Isn't that what we do in America? Whoever's got the most toys wins, right? You got to have the most. You got to have the bigger car. You got to have the best. It's all, it's all about the money in, a, in, in our society, right? Paul didn't say, I want to finish my race with a fat bank account. He didn't say that, did he? I want to I wanna finish with being, you know, having everybody just know my name. I want to make my name famous. I want to the, have the most views on YouTube. I want to be the greatest influencer that Jerusalem and the Middle East have ever seen. He said, no, no, no. I want to finish with joy. He said, I don't want to get to the end of my journey and be bitter and angry and filled with regret. Yeah, that's what he's saying. Because you can finish some things and not be happy with the finished product. You understand what I'm saying? You can finish. You ever bake a cake or try baking? You follow the recipe and you finish the recipe, but that thing don't look nothing like the picture in the book. You finished, but you don't finish with joy and nobody in your family. <laughs> that's good, honey. <laughs> Where's your dog, you know? <laughs> you finished... You finish, and you can finish. There's a lot of people that can finish. And, you, you know, you can find people that get to the end of their life and live older and not have joy, but they're finishing. Paul said, I, I don't want to just finish. This is so good. Somebody might need to hear it. I want to finish with joy. I want to be able to look back at my life and say, you know what? I ain't been perfect, but man, I was fully surrendered, and I did my call. I did what God's called me to do. I did my best, and God knows it. And so, God, I got something that I want to offer to you, and that is my life. I, I'm, I'm, I hope you're pleased with it, because it's, it's the best that I can do. I don't regret all of that. I, I don't look back and go, man, I wish I would have worshipped a little more. I wish I would have gave a little more. I wish I would have read the Bible. I wish I would have learned the Bible a little more. Paul said, I don't have none of them regrets. I got my joy. Again, I'm sure there were some things. See, I think we're all going to get to heaven. I believe we're all going to get to heaven and wish we all had another chance because we're going to leave a lot out here. But the Bible does talk about that some believers are going to be ashamed at his coming. Peter talks about that. First John talks about that. He says, live your life in such a way that you're not ashamed at his coming. That's what Paul is saying. I don't want to be ashamed at my coming. I love what Theodore Roosevelt said. And this is, the first one, let me back off. These are the two words. So fully committed is how you finish. How do you finish with joy? Avoid comparison. That's what he says here. Avoid comparison. That's, that, where do you get that? Where he says, I'm going to finish my ministry with joy. I'm going to finish with joy. The ministry that God has given me. Not the ministry God gave Peter. Not the ministry that God gave Barnabas. Not the ministry that he gave Silas. Silas is the worship leader from Antioch Church. Paul couldn't sing. He said, I'm not going to be jealous of that brother. But I'm not going to compare myself with other people. Because comparison will rob you of joy. So if you want to finish, you need to be fully committed. If you want to finish with joy, don't, uh, don't compare yourself with other people. That's the message God gave me out of this. Don't compare yourself. But I would say it robs more. Comparison robs more than just joy. It'll rob you of your relationship. 
It'll, it'll rob you of your relationship. You get into, you get into a, a relationship, you're dating, and God, whatever reason, brings another person in your life. Don't compare them to the... Man, we talk about this a lot in marriage counseling and stuff like that. You got, you got to not... And we all... This is a very common message I can preach anytime because it's killing all of us. It's the comparison thing. We live in a society where it's so easy to see what everybody else got for Christmas. You loved your Christmas family pictures until you saw the other church family with their family pictures, and now you feel like your family is awful. <laughs> Some of you guys were loving your Christmas gifts until you saw on Facebook what Aaron Decker got. And then Aaron was so happy that he saw what Josiah got. I mean, kids do it, but you know, adults do the same thing. I was so happy with my battery-powered hedge clipper that I did get. Hallelujah. Hallelujah until my neighbor got a new Dodge Ram. <laughs> you know who's been wanting a Dodge Ram? LaDon. It's a white one, brother, with chrome. You see him in a commercial. Who buys a truck for Christmas? I mean, come on, somebody. May the Lord speak to you. <laughs> no, I'm just saying. They put a red bow on it. I'm like, what is that? You can have the best. We had the best Christmas my family did this year. This was the best Christmas because of a lot of things. One of them was my dear mama got to come. This time last year, she was battling be uh, breast cancer. Locked up in the home, couldn't leave the house. She even has her hair. She, is she watching? It's beautiful hair, mama. She got her hair and she got the laugh. We laughed, and laughed at Joshua and Josiah all night. We had a good time. And it was a great Christmas. And I want to keep it that way because that's, you might have had a better Christmas. You might have had a better gift. Like my neighbor has better gifts. Other people got better gifts. But if we start comparing ourselves with other people, it will rob you of your joy. And Paul said, and Paul owned it. Paul even said, I, when it comes to the other apostles, he calls them super apostles. Paul was always compared to James, Jesus' brother. He was always compared to Peter. These dudes walked with Jesus. Paul did not. There's no mention that he even knew Jesus. They were alive at the same time. But if Paul ran into Jesus, or some theologians believe he did, I don't believe he did. Because if Paul did see Jesus when he was alive, he would have wrote about it. Paul was always called the inferior apostle. Because he was always compared. He described himself as being uh, born abnormally. That's how Paul identified. He said, I'm an apostle. And he said, but I'm like one that was born abnormally. I, I'm not like the other. He called them super apostles. They said in 2 Corinthians that Paul's words when he wrote them down were weighty and bold. But his physical ability to communicate and preach was weak. 2 Corinthians, they said that about Paul. He was not a good public speaker. But I love what Paul's attitude was. None of these things move me. He went on to say when he's talking about being compared to other people that he's not a super apostle, he says this, but I know who I belong to and I know whom I serve. I know who I belong to and I know who I'm served. I may not be like Peter. I may not be like a, this encourager, but I am who I am and I'm going to be faithful with what God's given me. I'm going to finish my race with joy. I'm going to finish with joy because I'm not going to compare myself with other people. And we live in a society where that pressure is always on us. That Christmas dinner was good. Wasn't as good as Thanksgiving dinner. And so you guys might have heard that. You know what they had said to the ones who cooked? Pressure. Pressure. There's always pressure to perform. I've learned this. There's always pressure to perform when we really don't believe in who we are. Did you catch that? If you believe and know who you are... There's no pressure to perform. There's always something. Whenever you play the comparison game, I'm closing for real in a few minutes. Always remember this. Whenever you play the comparison game, you will lose every time. You will lose every time. Comparison is the enemy of joy. Look at a couple of these scriptures, then I'm, I'm going to close. Galatians, Paul wrote, he said, but let, let each one examine his own work. And then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. I'm happy in my hedge trimmer. My hedges look better than my neighbor's does, so there. 
He says, he says, rejoice in your own work. Re rejoice in what you do have. Re rejoice. Oh, I don't have a whole lot. You're going to be like Gideon. Gideon had nothing. And the angel appeared to Gideon in Judges chapter 6 and said, Gideon, you mighty man of valor, go take out the enemy. And, and he looked and said, mighty? He said, if I'm mighty and God is mighty, this is what he said. I love it in the Bible. He said, then where are all the miracles that I read about? How you led Israel out of Egypt. You parted the Red Sea. Gideon is saying that to God. Where is all your miracles, God? How come the healings don't happen all the time? I love the Bible. It's raw. You know what the angel said back to him? Go anyway. In fact, in the Hebrew, it says this. We learned this on Wednesday night. I love Wednesday nights. And he says, go in the strength that you have left. Gideon, I, you know, compare yourself to this group and that group. That's why you're eating your food behind a garage and you're having a pity party and you're falling apart. But he's saying, if you would just rejoice in what I do have given you and run your race with what I've given you, you will finish. So Paul said, let each one have his own work and rejoice in it. And if you really want a, a, a scripture from a strong preacher named James, again, he's that very loud and blunt preacher. This is what he says about comparison. He says, but when you have envy and strife, you will have confusion. And listen to this, in every evil spirit in the Hebrew, it says spirit will be present. When you have, he didn't say homosexuality, murder. He didn't say, he said, when you got envy and strife, it's all you need. You don't need all that other stuff. You don't need all that murder. You don't need, mm, you don't need murder. All you need is envy and strife. You're going to have confusion and every evil spirit will be present there. Whoa. That's from comparing. So when that enemy tries to say, Man, look what you got. You think you got something, but look at so-and-so. Look at so-and-so's marriage. Look at so-and-so's uh, relationship. Look at so-and-so's gifts. Look at so-and-so's bank account. When you start doing that, I'm sit, right now the enemy is doing it because he don't want you to finish. You got to be like Paul and say, no, 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 I know who I am. I don't know what's going on in them. I, my neighbor might have needed a Ram truck for 20-some years, and I don't know his story. So I learned to say, thank you, God, for blessing that man. I'm going to thank you of what you've given me because if I have that attitude, I will finish with joy. So this last message today in this last year, if we want to finish with joy, we got to be fully committed. Bring this into 2022. Fully committed. And we'll avoid comparison. We may need to hear this message again. It's going to be on our YouTube channel in about another month. We're going to need to all watch it again, including me. Because we're going to get right back to social media, right back to this and that. I mean, it just, it's the pressure is always there. You talk about football. You a Lions fan? <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> Here they come. Well, you know what? But none of these things move me. Because <laughs> I'm going to watch today, baby. <laughs> Got to have a little fun on church. Amen. But you know what? We got to be like that with our faith. None of these things going to move me. None of these things are going to move me. Come on, can we just uh, stand right now? Father, we thank you for this word. We want to finish with joy today. We want to finish with joy today. I want to sing that, that one song, and it was so good. You did a couple runs there, a couple of them songs, but I love that one song where... That's all I have is a hallelujah. Can, can, we, can we just go? It may not be much. I love that line. may not be much, but it's all I have for a king. Isn't that a beautiful song? And um, Steve was talking about a tree. And the Holy Spirit just gave me this. It's in Psalms 92. I talked about it before, but the Bible says that God shall make the righteous like a palm tree. You ever wonder why he said a palm tree? Because a palm tree can take a storm, can take a hurricane. And that bad boy will go all the way down. Palm tree will. An oak be uprooted. Scripture says the righteous who are planted, fully committed in the house of God will flourish in the courts of our Lord. And I shall make them as a palm tree. That means the storms of 2020, 2021 will be blowing. And it hit us. 
It's hit many of you. It's hit all of us. But I love what a palm tree does. It goes right back up. In 2022, I'll prophetically say it by faith. We're going to arise in Jesus' name. I'm going to say it in faith. You don't have to receive it. I'm going to receive it. My dad spoke it out yesterday at our Christmas thing. He believes this COVID thing, we're going to make a sharp left turn. I said, amen. Right to something bigger, right to something better. Come on, I'm believing that. I'm going to believe that. It's better to believe that than it's going to get worse. But even if it does, none of these things move me. Because I'm rooted and I'm grounded like that palm tree. So come on, hurricane. Is that the best you got? Because all I'm going to give him is my hallelujah. Come on, can we worship with this song? Let's just just close with this one song today. Worship in the King. Come on, do that right now. Praise you again and again. Come on, those of you at home, lift those hands. It may be the only thing you have. Come on, give it to him. Everyone. Thanks for watching our service today. Hopefully it has been a blessing to you. And listen, if it has blessed you, why don't you subscribe? If you're watching by our YouTube channel, subscribe and share that with a friend. Or also, I would love to hear from you, especially if you have received Christ through our ministry or a word of encouragement. It's really been a blessing to you. Just take a few minutes and shoot us an email. I would love to hear that. That encourages our staff. It encourages me. And uh, we really make a big deal about that. So uh, thank you for watching, and we hope to see you again real soon. God bless you.